Oxford University Greek Society has a long tradition in um, having interesting talks by interesting speakers, and one of them is Mr. Takis Fotopoulos, who. Oh, we're very glad you're here with us tonight. Um, who is Takis Fotopoulos, and what is his contribution? We'll let Nicolas Rousselis tell us a few things about it. Nicola? Thanks very much. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. Um, sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties, as you can see. Um, so what I uh, what what I want to try to do is just give a very brief overview overview of what what sort of thing we're talking about here, so that you have a somewhat clear idea of where this talk is coming from, mm -hmm. what it's going to be about. And then I'm going to pass over to Takis. Um, so one of the central uh, central pillars of the theory that uh, Takis has been developing over the past, uh, what, 30 years or more, um, is um, uh, draws um, theoretical insights from a number of traditions um, in left-wing thought. Um, from the anarcho-socialist, uh, Bakuninist, um, Kropotkinite uh, theories of the 19th century, um, from the, the classical tradition of democracy, and the tradition of classical democracy, um, and the thought of Cornelius Castoriadis, among others. And finally, uh, the new social movements that developed in, uh, and unraveled uh, in, in Europe um, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and I just want to mention briefly what um, I, I'm going to use, the, I'm going to use, and I think uh, Takis might also want to use a, a blanket term for many of these, these theories uh, he, he is concerned with, uh, anarcho-socialist, mutualist socialists, um, uh, socialist uh, libertarianists, libertarians, mutualist libertarians, and so on, as <coughs> libertarian socialists. I'm going to try very briefly to, 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 to say what, what I think this, this theory is about, and of course Takis is, uh, is going to try to expand on that. Um, there, there are a few insights that, um, that um, uh, traditional uh, libertarian socialists have, have drawn upon and have subscribed to. And um, these insights for them have a, have a, a normative aspect and an explanatory aspect. So many libertarian socialists or, or socialists in the libertarian tradition, if you like, um, have offered insights about what's wrong with society, what the problems are. For example, uh, you know, Bakunin was trying to solve lots of... He, some of his ideas were about how to solve poverty and degradation in his uh, native Russia at the time. Um, um, Kropotkin, uh, Bakunin uh, had, had a similar, similar approach explaining uh, the misery, poverty, and segregation, and offering an emancipatory project that, can, that in, in, in their view, in, in the libertarian socialist view, could uh, solve all these problems. So um, the, 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 the libertarian socialists, all these people, share some, some core insights, and uh, Tack is going to expand on them. Some of these core insights have to do first with their commitment, allegiance, and deep uh, belief in a form of egalitarianism, an egalitarianism that includes all people and which attempts to uh, give everyone equal access to the means of production. Um, that's the first insight. Second insight is their anti-authoritarianism. Um, libertarians of all strands despise hierarchy and authority and they're very suspicious of it. Third aspect of these theories that uh, these theories share in, share in common is their uh, voluntarianism. They believe that people should engage in relations with one another and as part of their political community on the basis of voluntary, unregulated, unforced agreement and exchange. And the final insight, key insight in my opinion, is the emphasis on autonomy and uh, the idea that individuals but also collectives should choose their ends and the means to their accomplishment uh, on the basis of uh, free choice or free will. Now, um, 
as I said before, there are, there's an emancipatory side to this, uh, to these theories, and an explanatory side. The explanatory side is about telling us why we are in the quagmire we are in now, why there is poverty, why there is degradation, why there is inequality, and so on and so forth. And many libertarian socialists offer this analysis, and indeed Takis has tried to, to offer such an analysis. And there's the emancipatory side, of course, which is, okay, we have given some explanations, we have some thoughts about and insights about how, um, how and why these problems arise, what are we going to do about them? And this is the emancipatory side. So in this backdrop, Mr. Fotopoulos has developed, um, uh, has developed a theory over the past... Um, the past 30 years or so, and um, uh, he tries to do that by drawing upon the insights of libertarian socialists, of the classical democracy tradition, and of new social mo the, 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 the theories and ideas behind the new social movements. Um, and indeed, he proposes a system of a socialist inspired system of uh, joint ownership in the means of production, which includes extensive direct, uh, sorry, not representation, I said the bad word, exactly the bad word, <laughs> direct democracy and the use of direct democracy as far and as extensively as possible, um, both in the allocation of resources in the in society and economy and in the distribution and indeed in any aspect where um, democracy can, um, can express our commitment to autonomy, voluntar voluntariness, anti-authoritarianism mm -hmm. and equality. Um, and in doing so, Mr. Fotopoulos um, uh, taught um, for many years at the North uh, London Polytechnic, where uh, he, he tried to he develop these ideas, transmitted them to students and so on. But with the advent of Thatcherism, as you can understand, he, he uh, perfectly justifiably got fed up with all these uh, cutbacks in resources and so on at university. So um, he, uh, he left university and went rogue. Um, um, tried to uh, develop his own thought through his uh, in his um, in his uh, new founded journal Democracy in Nature, and afterwards through the journal of uh, inclusive International Journal of Inclusive Democracy, uh, which he founded with the with the goal of expanding on these ideas and um, with the with um, the view of um, with a view towards uh, drawing upon these three traditions of thought, libertarian socialism, the classical democracy tra tra uh, tradition, um, and the new social movements. Um, and since then, um, uh, since the 1970s, he's written a number of books, translated in a dozen languages, um, and he's also um, a columnist for the, the, the Greek newspaper Elefthrotypia, where he, 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 he uh, writes uh, an analysis column. Um, Mr. Fotopoulos is going to speak uh, on the topic of uh, the multidimensional, the, multi uh, the recent complex multidimensional crisis and uh, inclusive democracy. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. <coughs> I'd like to thank first the organizers of this uh, uh, meeting tonight, uh, gave me the opportunity to meet you. Uh, and uh, thank you also, Nicola, for your introduction. Uh, the only thing I would like to uh, add on what you said is that uh, the basic difference between uh, the two wings of socialism, the socialist movement were uh, had to do with the role of the state. That is, uh, that was the main reason why the first international split between uh, Marxists on the one hand and libertarians on the other. And the reason was uh, the role of the state. That is, uh, that's why usually the uh, Marxist wing was called the statist wing because they thought that the role of the state was essential uh, during the transitional period in this view and uh, were in fact in a sense prophetic because uh, they foresaw the development of statist socialism in terms of what happened later on in the uh, Soviet Union. That is. Uh, they predicted, in other words, that um, state is socialism is going to end up as a kind of authoritarian socialism. Uh, <clears throat> so, as uh, Nicholas correctly pointed out, um, the project of inclusive democracy that uh, 
I support, uh, and I try to develop uh, these years, uh, is in fact a synthesis of the traditions uh, that developed in the last uh, uh, 120 or 100 or 200 years mainly. The traditions first of the libertarian wing of socialism and then of the uh, democratic tradition and the autonomous tradition where uh, in the post-war period you can mention Hannah Arendt uh, and of course uh, Castoriadis and so on. And uh, then the radical movements within the new social movements, the radical currents rather within the uh, new social movements, the feminist movement, the green movement, uh, the identity uh, movements and so on. Uh, so the idea is to synthesize and at the same time transcend uh, these uh, uh, tra uh, traditions so that we can develop a project uh, for our era because obviously you cannot use uh, the analysis of the 19th century in order to explain the reality of the 21st. Um, and uh, <coughs> this is an area where a lot of uh, work has to be done and we try to do uh, some work in pages of, uh, from the pages of democracy and uh, other venues. And uh, <coughs> we tried, in other words, to develop a modern, if you like, uh, theory, mm -hmm. uh, a theorization of these trends, of these uh, traditions, and how we can explain today the reality using uh, this kind of uh, analysis. So what I'm going to do very briefly, of course, because uh, the time we have available is uh, short tonight, is to try to see how we can explain the present crisis, uh, which is not only economic crisis, as we are going to see, although today uh, the economic crisis is uh, from today's news, uh, and uh, then uh, how we can see the causes of this crisis, uh, how they are related very much to what we can do in order to create or remake, if you like, society along uh, the demands of these traditions uh, to which we can, uh, as I said before, before, we can try to transcend them and create a different sort of analysis. So, we're talking first about a crisis. Uh, what crisis and uh, uh, what are the causes of this crisis? Um, I would think that uh, the present crisis is a multidimensional crisis. It's not just economic. It's not just even ecological, although the ecological crisis, of course, is uh, again uh, front page news uh, in the last particularly two years. It's also, as we're going to see, a crisis in politics, a crisis in, uh, uh, at a social level, a social crisis. And at the same time, it's a cultural and ideological crisis. So it's a crisis which extends to uh, various spaces, and that's why we may call it a multidimensional crisis. Furthermore, this crisis is a universal crisis, and it is a universal crisis in a double sense. It is universal in the sense that it is globalized. You see today how the economic crisis is a global crisis, or how it developed as a, very quickly from uh, the financial crisis in the United States, how it developed very quickly into a global crisis. And uh, today we are facing a very serious recession, if not depression. So first, it is a global crisis. It's a, a universal crisis in the geographical sense. And uh, the same applies, of course, to the ecological crisis, because of the nature of the ecological uh, problem itself. And as we shall see, uh, we can uh, uh, de describe various indications that the crisis is also uh, global in the sense of the other dimensions of the crisis I mentioned, the social crisis, the cultural crisis, and so on. Then it is universal in another sense. It is universal in the sense that uh, 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 from the point of view of its scope, it extends not just to the content 
of uh, uh, this dimension, that is uh, what we mean by economic crisis, social crisis, and so on. Uh, but it extends also to the values. In other words, it extends from the institutions to the values. It's not just the institutions which are the, in crisis, the market economy, if you like, is in crisis. It's also the values of the market economy that are in crisis. And this is more important because as we shall see, the basic cause of the ecological crisis is what we may call the growth economy. And the growth economy is based on a certain ideology, the idea of progress. And the idea of progress is a basic idea of the Enlightenment. And it was adopted by both Orthodox social scientists and Marxist social scientists. Okay? <clears throat> so we shall see that today uh, it's not just some basic institutions that are in crisis, but also the values behind these institutions. And this is very important. So, the next question is, okay, if we accept that there is a crisis, what are the causes of it? And this is what I'm going to try to discuss briefly tonight. I think, and this is the basic uh, tenet of uh, the Inclusive Democracy Project, that we can explain every dimension of the crisis if we uh, assign or if we try to attribute every dimension of this crisis to a common phenomenon. The common phenomenon is the concentration of power. We can see, in other words, that uh, we can explain the economic crisis in terms of the tremendous concentration of economic power. Similarly, we can express, uh, we can explain the political crisis, the crisis in politics, in terms of the concentration of political power. And uh, the same as regards the ecological crisis. We can explain the ecological crisis in terms of the growth economy, which is a byproduct of the uh, concentration of power at the economic level, and so on. Uh, now, if we agree that uh, the concentration of power at all levels could explain this multidimensional crisis, the next question is how this concentration of power has taken place. And the answer is that we have to go back to the main institutions of modernity. The main institutions of modernity were, of course, first the institutionalization of the system of market economy. Markets, local markets existed always, but the system of market economy, a system, in other words, of self-regulating markets, is a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that uh, emerged uh, 200 years ago. Uh, so first, the uh, setting up of the system of the market economy, and second, the parallel setting at the political level, the parallel establishment at the political level of what has been called representative democracy. In fact, up to the end of the uh, 18th century or so, when people were talking about democracy, they meant direct democracy. They meant, in other words, a kind of democracy or similar kind of democracy, then, uh, uh, the kind of democracy that developed in classical Athens, and then we can see the same tradition developing in uh, uh, various uh, cities in the Middle Ages, and so on. So, it was in fact an American invention, this idea of representative democracy, where uh, the founding fathers of the American Constitution uh, created a Constitution that required representation, not because uh, the United States, even at that time, was a big state, but uh, on the contrary, they created such a big state, despite the fact that there were trends below in order to have self-government. Uh, you know, perhaps you may have heard about the East England, uh, the New England uh, uh, local democracies, uh, which have been created by people uh, who have uh, migrated to the United States uh, 300 years ago or so. <coughs> and they were uh, organizing, they ran the local societies on the basis of direct democracy. So there were such trends, and these trends were bypassed by the founding fathers to create a kind of representative democracy. And Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, was frank about it. He said uh, that people uh, uh, who have certain economic power and uh, uh, who know better, uh, those people should govern rather than uh, everybody else. They, 
deliberately tried, in other words, to exclude a direct form of democracy. <clears throat> and this, of course, was a, a very a significant development because the market economy, the system of the market economy, is based, on, uh, as you know, on the individual, on the individual producer, on the individual consumer, uh, and uh, this uh, kind of uh, economic organization very much is complemented by a representative democracy rather than by direct democracy where it is the collective that takes the decisions, the collective, uh, the assembly in other words, or the local assembly or whatever. <coughs> so if we examine the dynamics of these two main institutions of modernity, the market economy and the representative democracy, we can explain the present concentration of power. In other words, let's take the economic level. Uh, the market economy that was established uh, in the 18th century uh, was more or less a laissez-faire kind of economy. Laissez-faire in the sense that uh, there were independent uh, producers and consumers uh, who were determining prices and so on. Uh, that is, uh, what has been called in economics, uh, neoclassical economics, uh, more or less describe fairly this sort of situation. Um, that's why in the periodization of history that um, I tried in the, uh, in the book towards an inclusive democracy, I distinguish between three main phases of modernity. What I call the uh, liberal phase, the liberal phase was uh, between um, 1830 to 1875 or something, when a deliberate attempt was made to create a kind of liberal economy uh, with, uh, in other words, uh, relaxation of social controls as much as possible on markets, uh, even an attempt to internationalize the economy. The first. Uh, globalization, if you like to call it like this, started at that time. The first attempt was at that time. Then, <coughs> this uh, phase was followed after some uh, intermediate phase of protection and so on, by the statist phase. Uh, that was a phase which uh, began, of course, in the extreme with the Soviet experiment, where the state took over everything. Uh, there was no market, the central planning replaced the market mechanism and so on. And uh, then it was continued, paradoxically enough, by the uh, National Socialist regime in uh, Germany. Uh, in fact, the first Keynesian policies were implemented by Hitler. And then by the fascist regime in Italy. So, the first statist uh, uh, regimes that we can mention in history, which try to implement uh, <laughs> policies where the state intervened directly in the, in the economic affairs, were, apart from the Soviet Union, were the uh, fascist regimes in Germany and Italy. After the Second World War, however, <coughs> when the Axis was defeated, the Western democracies introduced various degrees of stating. We had in Britain the first welfare state in 1945. Uh, this was uh, then uh, exported, if you like, to many other countries, although in the Scandinavian countries they have started some sort of uh, welfare state even before the war, but basically it was expanded there as well in the post war period. Um, and all the basis of uh, what we call uh, the uh, post-war uh, statist phase uh, were actually developed in Western Europe at that time, but then they were exported to the United States. Uh, although some sort of state, even you could say, started with the New Deal of Roosevelt, but it was not exactly the same. Anyway, and uh, finally, when the statist period collapsed uh, because, I'm going to come to this in a moment, the statist kind of uh, economy came in conflict with the internationalization that developed in the 70s. Uh, 
than the present neoliberal phase developed. So the criterion I'm using to distinguish between these three phases, the liberal, the statist, and the neoliberal, is the degree of social control on markets. Now, why this is important? It is important because as soon as the market economy was established, this was the basic characteristic of a market economy, any social control on markets was either minimized or even phased out, if possible. In other words, for uh, endogenous reasons that uh, I can explain to you, uh, the uh, local markets, which were socially controlled, were replaced by this system of uh, self-control markets, where the economic elites which control the means of production and therefore indirectly were controlling also the market economy, had to secure uh, the commodification of the means of production and particularly labor. In other words, unless an employer, a factory owner, say, in the 19th century, could secure a smooth and uh, regular flow of labor, then he could not secure, he could not guarantee the fulfillment of uh, his or her orders. In other words, labor had to become a, a commodity, although of course a fictitious commodity, it was not a real commodity, but uh, it had to be as free as possible, as flexible, if you like, as possible, for the better functioning, for the most efficient functioning of the market economy. So in this first liberal phase, we have the first attempt to marketize the economy in the sense of lifting all controls on social markets, or as many as possible. Uh, so that's why various uh, laws against trade unions, etc., were introduced in uh, the 1830s and the 1840s. It was a period like the 1970s or 1980s, very similar in the kind of legislation that was introduced to control the emerging at that time uh, strong socialist movement. Then <coughs> the backlash uh, to this kind of uh, marketization came later on in Germany with Wiesberg and uh, because of the strong socialist movement there, and later on followed in Britain and elsewhere, where uh, first there were some protectionist policies to protect uh, local industries against competition, and then they ended up with the statism, as I mentioned before, of uh, Germany, Italy, and so on, and finally in uh, West Europe where the state now was intervening directly in the economy. It was the state during the statist phase which was directly determining the level of aggregate demand, the level of employment, even the way income was distributed. So this was a, a period of maximum social control on markets, okay? which of course uh, uh, is uh, antithetical to the kind of uh, market economy we had before in the liberal phase. But this kind of statism was feasible, was possible, only to the extent that we were talking about nation states. In other words, only to the extent that the economies were closed. Why? Because as soon as you start opening markets, then <coughs> That means that competition because it becomes much uh, fiercer than before. That means that producers uh, have to offer the best uh, advantages, economic advantages, to people who wanted to invest, both domestic investors and foreign investors. So, uh, as soon as the market economy started opening up, and it started opening up informally first, that is, there were, of course, the GATT rounds uh, introduced by the post-war uh, international monetary system, uh, the Bretton Woods system, and uh, there were, in other words, trends within the system to open up. But still, uh, the capital markets were very much controlled. There were exchange controls, strict exchange controls. Um, labor markets were controlled. So, although 
trade was expanding, still the institutional framework was still one that uh, could be characterized as closed, as one fit for a closed economy rather than an open economy. Now, this creates a fundamental contradiction because the informal opening of the economies and the expansion of foreign trade in the 60s and the 70s created a new institution, which is the basic institution of today's globalization, the multinational corporation or transnational corporation. The transnational or multinational corporation uh, was a phenomenon of the late 60s, 70s. At that time, we had a vast expansion of this sort of corporation, which were very different from the kind of corporation that existed before, which uh, were aiming to the local market, basically to the domestic market, and uh, production were taking place in the, lo uh, in the local economy and so on. Now, for the first time, we have a kind of corporation which produces and distributes uh, its products, uh, or rather spreads its production and distribution all over the world. That means that multinational corporations pressed a lot in the late 70s particularly to open up markets, especially uh, they were objecting exchange controls, uh, restrictions on capital markets and so on, which were making the transfer of capital from one country to another difficult. Uh, so uh, they created a kind of informal opening of capital markets through the euro-dollar market which later became uh, Euro-Yen, uh, Euro-whatever. The idea was, in other words, to bypass the controls that the American government, which had uh, very strict controls at the time, very strict counter controls, to bypass all these controls, they created informal markets all over the place where they did not have to follow the obligations that the American Treasury was imposing on them. So, uh, that's how the informal opening up of markets ha uh, happened. That means, therefore, that when Thatcher came uh, uh, here and uh, uh, took over uh, the uh, British uh, government and the British political scene in Germany, we can say later on, and uh, the same uh, after a couple of years in the United States with uh, Ronald Reagan, what they did was to institutionalize what was already happening. They institutionalized, in other words, the opening of markets and the uh, creation of flexible conditions on every market. They institutionalized uh, open capital market. And first, they institutionalized the opening of a commodity market. That is, uh, they tried to lift any control in the import and export of commodities. <coughs> goods and later on services as well. Then they uh, open up the capital markets uh, and at the same time they tried and they succeeded in uh, liberalizing the labor market. They did not open up the, the labor markets because obviously these were not in the interest of uh, 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 capitalists because uh, uh, opening up a full market would mean that uh, every unemployed uh, Indian or Chinese could uh, uh, move here. So they did not like this, but what they did was something which uh, was much more significant, that they liberalized all those markets so that uh, they created what they call flexible labor conditions, flexible labor relations, which meant that um, all protection of labor that has been introduced in the past in terms of trade union legislation, uh, in terms of uh, employers not having the right to hire, to hire and fire whoever they liked or disliked and so on. All of these rights were basically uh, <coughs> undermined and eventually even abolished. And uh, this way they created a flexible uh, labor power, uh, which meant of course that uh, the marketization process I, I uh, referred to before uh, became, in other words, the rule of the day. The marketization process was such so that it extended now to all kinds of markets, 
from the capital market to the, the labor market and later on to the financial markets. And this is the price we pay today. It was the uh, deregulation of financial markets that created the present uh, crisis, as we shall see in a moment. Um, so, uh, this uh, opening up of markets, this marketization process, has created at the same time a huge concentration of economic power. This is shown not only by the fact that uh, something like uh, 300 or 400 uh, multinational corporations today control uh, most of world trade, uh, both in commodities and services, uh, 50, I think, percent or even more of uh, world production, perhaps 60 percent, and so on. Uh, and also, this was shown in uh, a huge concentration of income and wealth. In other words, uh, the latest uh, international labor report, the uh, United Nations was published a week ago, showed that uh, between 1990 and uh, 2005, there was a huge increase in inequality in three quarters of countries, in uh, three, quarter, uh, three quarters of the countries uh, which were taken uh, into consideration, we had a huge increase in inequality, according to this report. And of course, this is shown also by the fact that uh, in the United States, for instance, uh, the uh, moment of the highest uh, degree of inequality uh, took place in 1929, just before the Great Depression, when something like one third of total income was controlled by 5% of the population, and now, this has gone up just before the present financial crisis. <coughs> this percentage has gone up to 37 percent or something. So we had a tremendous gap between uh, uh, the 5 or 10 percent of the population at the top and the 5 or 10 percent of the population at the bottom that had been created in the past 20 or 30 years. And this is, of course, uh, easily explainable in the sense that during the statist phase, as I mentioned before, the state was taking effective control in order to reduce these inequalities through the progressive income tax system, through the welfare state, uh, through public investment, and so on. Now, all this has gone. During the neoliberal phase, the welfare state was undermined effectively and was replaced by the various safety nets. Uh, the progressiveness of the income tax system was uh, effectively abolished. Uh, today, the maximum tax rate in Britain is uh, 40%, whereas uh, 20 years ago it was uh, 60%. In Sweden, it was 70 or 80%. Now, all this has gone. Why? Because now the economy, the market economy, is controlled by the supply side of the economy, whereas in uh, the statist period, Keynesian policies were implemented according to which uh, it was the demand side of the economy that determined the level of income and employment. And therefore, the state could intervene to control aggregate demand in order to control employment, to secure some sort of full employment, and to control also the distribution of income. All these controls have gone in the neoliberal period. Now, the state, the only thing that can do to uh, influence the economy is to take uh, or introduce various uh, uh, incentives on, on the supply side of the economy to uh, make employers, to make investors more willing to invest. And uh, even now, when Brown uh, yesterday was uh, saying that he is going to take measures to fight the, infl the recession, which is becoming uh, uh, worse and worse uh, every day, uh, all he said was that he would take measures again on the supply side of the economy. That is, he, he said, instead of expanding, for example, investment on the National Health Service or on uh, education and so on, what he said is that he is going to reduce taxes. Why? So that employers and supposedly everybody else, consumers, etc., could spend more money on the economy, and this could create, according to this argument, uh, more demand, and uh, more demand would expand uh, the level of economic activity, employment, etc. <coughs> Which, of course, is a very ineffective way, among other things, is a very ineffective way to influence the level of economic activity. 
because just by reducing taxes, this does not mean that people would spend more money, especially in a period of uncertainty like the pre present period. Many people may simply get more money and try to repay uh, loans or save more or whatever. This was the idea, the Keynesian idea, that uh, in order to create more income and employment, the state has to intervene directly to create demand directly, not indirectly through reduction in taxes, etc. Anyway, so if we take into account all this marketization process and the uh, concentration of power that has taken place in the last uh, 20, 30 years, you can easily explain the present financial crisis. That is, what happened is not that uh, the crisis is due to, as uh, neoliberals say, some greedy bankers and financiers. This is a silly explanation, because anyway, financiers, uh, that's uh, their job, to try to make as much money as possible. So uh, you can't uh, accuse a butcher for uh, killing animals. The same thing as with the bankers. Bankers try to, and financiers try to make money as much as possible for their institution. Uh, nor, of course, you can say that it is the state that is to be blamed, as some neoliberals argue that uh, uh, since uh, Clinton tried to uh, create uh, conditions better for housing and uh, uh, he induced uh, building societies, etc., in the states to uh, relax their conditions on uh, lending money, this is the cause of the financial crisis. All these explanations are silly because they cannot explain in the first place where all this money will come because we have a very significant accumulation of money, of capital if you like, in the United States and in Britain and so on at that time, which was used in order to make all these extra loans. So where all this money can, uh, was found? To explain this, we have to take into account everything I said before, that is, the liberalization and opening of all markets, and then we can see how this crisis developed. In other words, as soon as labor markets and capital markets were opened up and liberalized, then a process of deindustrialization happened in Britain, uh, all over Western Europe and so on, and in America. And uh, correspondingly, a process of industrialization developed in countries like China, India, Brazil, and so on. Now, why this? Because capital, uh, in the search for uh, better opportunities, obviously moved from countries like uh, Britain or States, where wage rates were something like uh, 30 times higher than in China, moved to countries like China, where markets have also uh, been liberalized there after the collapse of the Maoist regime. And, uh, its succession by the present uh, leadership, uh, they found much more profitable to move in these countries and exploit the uh, very uh, favorable uh, conditions of, uh, uh, for them of labor, uh, low labor, I'm sorry, low wages and uh, uh, having a productive labor force and an educated labor force. The same happened also in Eastern Europe after the collapse of. Uh, uh, actually existing socially, then capital could move to countries like uh, Czechoslovakia or uh, uh, Hungary and so on and find uh, very uh, good conditions in terms of uh, low wages and also in terms of productivity because these countries uh, they, uh, had a very developed kind of labor force in terms of uh, uh, training, etc. And therefore, um, a lot of industry has moved from countries like Britain to countries in the East, in Eastern Europe, in China, India, etc. That's why we had a very significant deindustrialization in the West and the opposite in the East. In other words, we had a new international division of labor when all these, uh, all this process of uh, opening up and uh, liberalizing markets developed in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Now, that meant that the countries uh, like China, India, etc., which uh, have seen a significant industrial development as soon as 
lots of multinational corporations mm -hmm. moved there, developed very significant surpluses. That is, surpluses in the balance of payments account, because obviously if you uh, export much more than you import, and given the very low level of incomes in China and India, <coughs> the imports the import level generally was much lower than export, so they developed significant surpluses in their balance of payment. And what they did with all this money? They released there, instead of uh, spending up this money in order to develop uh, their own production uh, sector rather than relying on multinational corporations, or at least instead of spending all this money to develop welfare states which were miserable, uh, both in China and in India in the last uh, 20 years, they simply deposited this money in Western markets, that is, in the Western financial markets. So we have, on the one hand, the movement of industry to the East, and then we have a reverse flow of money now from the East to the West. So Western financial markets were flooded with money in the last 10-15 um, years, mainly from these countries countries like India, China, and so on, and Asia. And uh, uh, finances and bankers in uh, the West, uh, having so much liquidity, obviously they try to uh, exploit the situation, in other words, to make as much money as possible out of this. And um, although initially these funds, which are called sovereign funds because they are controlled by the state, uh, were uh, used to buy bonds, treasury bonds in the States, uh, and uh, similarly bonds from uh, uh, state bonds in Britain. Later on, they began to experimenting and uh, buy uh, financial products which were much more risky. In other words, uh, financiers in uh, the States first found a clever way to spread the risk. What they did was, uh, if you have a market, say, with an American building society, instead of the uh, building society uh, lending the money to you and then waiting for you to repay your loan in uh, 20, 30 years or whatever, if you repay it, they found clever ways in terms of what is called securitization. In other words, they made some special uh, packets where they um, split up the market, say if it is $200,000 market, they uh, <coughs> uh, split it up into 10, 20 parts, and then they made some special bonds which they were selling around, uh, and uh, bonds which actually were yielding higher uh, interest rate than uh, the normal bonds, the normal treasury bonds. So the Chinese, the Indians, etc., were very keen to buy these bonds, and they started buying them in, in, en masse. Uh, however, the financiers in the West, uh, given the, uh, the, uh, the extra supply of money they had, the extra supply of liquidity they had, uh, they started becoming, uh, to undertake more and more risks, despite the fact that at the same time, as I said, try to spread the risk. So, uh, the result was that uh, given that uh, in the meantime financial markets were deregulated, as you remember, and banks and financial institutions did not even have to anymore to keep some reserve requirements. In the past, when uh, uh, a bank was, uh, uh, say, was uh, 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 trying to lend somebody money, you have to keep a reserve requirement, as we said. In other words, say 10% of the total loan had to be in the form of reserves, in the form of reserves, uh, cash, or whatever. Now, with the relaxation of all these controls, that meant that they did not have to keep almost nothing, uh, or very, a very small proportion of the total money available for lending. And the result was that they started lending people uh, who more or less were not likely to pay, to repay uh, their loans because they were low income groups, etc. And the obvious, the inevitable result was that repossessions uh, started expanding in the States uh, last year, in 2007. There was a mass of repossessions. And then at that time, financiers and bankers and so on discovered uh, 
that a lot of their support assets were just paper, uh, uh, paper money, they were just nothing, that is, they had uh, no real value. So in effect what happened now is that uh, many banks uh, all over the world, but particularly in Britain and in the States, uh, do not know exactly, because of this uh, process of securitization I mentioned, do not know exactly how much of the money, they're, the assets they're supposed to have are real assets, and how much is nothing. So they started uh, re restricting their lending activities. And despite the trillion of dollars now that the government is pumping into the uh, money market, still bankers are unwilling to lend money. They just started to uh, lend money, and uh, that's why we have this uh, credit crunch. And everything then follows uh, in a logical second. That is, this credit crunch created the conditions of lack of confidence, then stock values in stock exchanges started uh, declining rapidly, uh, then that meant that uh, consumers uh, started uh, reducing the consumption, especially of goods that are not necessary, like cars, etc. <coughs> and now we are in the middle of a recession that is getting worse and worse. So, uh, the present financial crisis, therefore, and uh, the economic crisis in general, which uh, uh, can be explained again in terms of the <coughs> high concentration of uh, uh, economic power, could well be explained, I think, in terms of this marketization process that, in other words, the dynamics in the life of the market economy that has led to uh, the high concentration of uh, economic power, measured in terms of income, wealth, etc., and uh, uh, could therefore give us an adequate explanation of why the concentration of power is a crucial factor uh, as against the economic level we discussed so far in explaining the economic crisis. The same can be done with the crisis in politics. That is why uh, we have today such a serious um, uh, symptoms of a crisis in politics, like the fact that uh, what is characterized as political apathy, that uh, we don't have anymore the mass political parties we used to have in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, why <coughs> representative democracy is uh, uh, so much in disrepute in uh, Britain and elsewhere. Why we have the mass abstention rates, uh, if you exclude uh, uh, the Obama phenomenon, which is a different story, uh, in the States, usually not more than 50% uh, or even less of people were bothering to vote in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years. And the same uh, all over the world. In Greece, we don't have this problem because we have uh, uh, obligatory uh, voting. That is, you have to vote by the law, and many people still uh, are afraid, although usually now there are no sanctions if you don't vote. But anyway, the law is there. So <coughs> uh, we have, and of course, the various scandals, uh, which happen uh, every year in every uh, advanced country and uh, again have undermined very much the significance of representative <coughs> democracy. And more important, the very fact that uh, people have been persuaded, even in Britain, <coughs> they have been persuaded that nobody bothers <coughs> about their vote. If you take into account that uh, <coughs> uh, in 2003, five years ago, uh, something like two million people uh, took uh, over the streets of London uh, demanding that uh, the war in Iraq would not start. And the next day Tony Blair uh, came out and said uh, the people say so, but uh, I say it differently and I know better and that's it. So people started uh, wondering uh, why bother to go then? Uh, that is, uh, who bothers about what we say? That is, all these are symptoms which explain uh, why there is all this uh, mass political apathy today. Uh, they represent, in other words, uh, what I said at the beginning, the cynicism that developed among people because of the continuous concentration of power in political elites. Why? Because in the first phase of the liberal phase I mentioned before, it was the idea that the parliament 
the representatives, the House of Representatives in the states would take decisions and were effectively taking decisions. Then in the statist phase we have something different. We have governments co uh, concentrating all power in their hand. It was not anymore parliaments, it was governments and political parties, mass political parties, that were taking all decisions. And now in the neoliberal phase we have an even higher degree of concentration of political power. Now it's not just government to take decisions. Now it just clicks around the president or the prime minister, usually of technocrats like uh, think tanks, etc., who, which take all effective decisions. And then uh, parties in parliament simply rubber stamp the decisions of these cliques. Um, that's why many people call the present situation statecraft rather than uh, politics anymore. It's not politics when uh, you're talking about how uh, to administer. Sorry, I 